going live. Okay. Are you ready? I'm ready. Well, hello to Annette Bay Pimentel. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. What what do friends call you? Annette? Annette. Yeah. Do you have a, do you have a nickname? Um, I had a nickname when I was a really little girl until my siblings uh, skewed it into a name that I didn't like. <laughs> and so then I, ever since then, I've been Annette. So I was Nene. You were Nene? my brothers said, yeah, they said it meant no, no baby goose. And I did not like that. So then we just switched over to Annette. You know, you're going to, you're going to, I think you're going to divulge a lot of secrets today. We just started. <laughs> This is great. So well, I don't uh, hi, have big brothers listening. <laughs> so. Okay. So hi, everybody. I'm Mel Rosenberg, the host of the Children's Literature Channel for the New Books Network. And Annette, welcome to the show. Thank I'm, you. And thank you for doing this. Well, it's it's my pleasure. We'll, we'll get to that later. But um, you can ask me <laughs> in okay. half an hour if, if it's your pleasure, too. Uh, okay. We're here to celebrate a really... Um, I want to say miraculous book based on our previous conversation. <laughs> um, a really, really, a, a, you don't say really unique, but a unique book uh, and one that's really, really close to my heart. And that's called Before Music. Mm -hmm. And I'm interested to know all about you and where you got the idea for this book. Uh, you have several other books. You have more coming out. Uh, mm -hmm. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you so much. You, your book launched in late June, so it's a baby yes. book. It's just out. You don't happen to have a copy to show everybody? I do. What a coincidence. I, yes. It's kind of big, so I have to hold it back so it will all be on the screen. And it's published by that? Abrams, which is a great is. publisher. And, um, and you have a wonderful illustrator. Yes. And this is Madison. Madison Safer is the illustrator, and this is her debut book. Um, she is so talented. Uh, in this book, she had to do a lot of drawing of rocks, <laughs> and she managed to make them lively and interesting. And yeah, she was wonderful to work with. A, a few words about the book, and maybe read it just like a show a page. Okay. And then I want to go right back to your babyhood. Okay. To the, to the days of Nene. And uh, <laughs> ah, excuse right. me, sorry. I'm sorry. You shouldn't have told me that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Can you show us some of the yes. uh, spreads? It's so beautiful. Yeah. So this book, I think of it as a social studies book, although it has a lot of science elements and stuff in it. It's it's based around the idea that music doesn't come out of nothing. It always starts somewhere with something. And most importantly, it starts with a person. And the book has a lot of different layers but one of the things is there is a through line of full page illustrations. And so I'll show you um, how those work. And it don't show me, show everybody else. I've, I've seen yeah. it. <laughs> All right, so there's this picture and you can see someone down in a cave and the words say, before music, a cache of ore lurks underground. And then move over here. As someone scoops out rocks, crushes them, scrap, and melts them into red hot molten metal. <laughs> they are making a bell. And you can see this full page. And then on the following pages, there's a lot more text that gives the information and answers questions. And then we highlight um, individual bells in this thing or other instruments. Yeah, and that's all through the whole, whole book. Incredible. And so I'm, I'm going to uh, tell you one of the remarkable things about the book is that you start every new topic, you start out very lyrically. Mm -hmm. The text is very lyric uh, with an uh, onomatopoeia and, mm -hmm. um, and it's wonderful. And Thank it gets you. you into it. And then you dive deep into the, into the science and the, and the matter and where mm -hmm. sounds come from and vibrations mm -hmm. and densely packed metal as opposed to not, or rocks, metal is densely packed, uh, right. rocks versus loose rocks right. and clay uh, when you glaze it. And and then you turn the page and then there's another lyrical uh, mm -hmm. page. It's mm -hmm. wonderful. It, 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 melds, it melds the heart with the mind. 
Thank you. Yeah, I also hope that it invites kids of many different ages to engage with the book because you can just read the book as a picture book and just read the pages like I just read to you and then skip the next pages until you get to the next section. Or um, I, if you're an older child who's really interested in a, like in biographies, then you can flip through and find the biographical things. Or if you're a, an older kid who's really interested in science, then you can find the science questions and look at it. So it, I'm hopeful that the many layers that are in the book will make it a book that will last through a child's, longer through a child's development and also opens it up to a wider variety of kids, like in a classroom or in a family that it can speak to a lot of different ages and interests. I, I was thinking that it resonates, but that's my stupid. Uh, <laughs> You're good at the but, puns. But, yeah, but it does resonate. Let's go back to Annette. You're a very interesting okay. person. Oh, thank you. Okay, tell us about your babyhood, your nannyhood, <laughs> and uh, everything that brought you to become a celebrated author. Uh, well, I am a fifth child. I am the fifth child of a fifth child of a fifth child. And I grew up uh, with six siblings. There are seven of us. Um, so I grew up in a very happy family. Um, we moved quite a bit while I was growing up. Part of the time it was for my dad's work and part of the time was because of financial reverses left our family in, um, in I would call a unstable housing situation. So we had to do some moving. So I got very used to moving, but we always had the constancy of a really close, a closely knit family. Um, um, and I grew up for like most of, from the time I was about eight, I lived in Utah. So I grew up there living in various places. Um, and then I went away to college um, and I started at Brigham Young University, but then I transferred to University of California, Berkeley, where I am a very proud Cal Bear. Um, I loved that place. I studied English literature and I went to Brandeis University and did a master's degree there. My original plan was to be an English professor, but when I was in graduate school, I realized, well, I loved my program. I loved things about my program. I loved my professors and my classmates, but I realized that I was actually more interested in teaching writing than in writing articles to increasingly smaller audiences. And so I did not complete my PhD. I left with a master's degree. Um, and then I, I was having a baby and I, ended up, I decided I would try staying home to see if I liked it and I loved it. Um, and so I stayed home with, um, we had six children and we moved a lot too for my husband's work. And so most of, I was pretty much a full-time well, mom. One I second, did. Annette, let's give it up for, for husbands for a moment. Okay. I, you know, I, I interview about 97% of the authors I interview are women. Yeah. I don't know why that it. is, but we can discuss it. I, I think I, I don't think that um, Kidlet is, is prejudiced against Jewish people, but um, they are sure are prejudiced against male people. Um, so tell us about your husband and what you're close to your daddy. Okay. What did he do? Let's do some daddy. Uh... Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, my dad was a civil engineer. Um, and he did uh, construction administration. Well, so he would hire us to when he had a job that needed to be done. We were the cleaning crew that would go in and clean it up um, so that the owners could take possession. So I have a lot of experience doing that. Um, yeah. And my husband is a lawyer. He's a law professor now. He worked in court administration, both for U.S. courts and then he worked for the U.N., going into post-conflict places um, and doing two things. One thing he would do is he would redesign court systems um, for countries that had suffered some kind of conflict. And then he also was the court manager for the war crimes tribunal for the former Yugoslavia in The Hague. And then switched over to being a professor. So that's what he does now, yeah. So um, I guess that everybody else has figured out that uh, you're part of the Mormon community. I am, yes. And we, we, 
and 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 yeah, I was going to say we call it our church is Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints, but we are commonly known as Mormons. Yeah. Okay. Well, it, it's too long, you know. Together with your name, <laughs> it is long. But that's true. the whole interview is just going to be you know naming things. <laughs> just one name. Yeah. yeah. Um. So, but but I think that correct me. I know very little uh, about your people and your faith, but a, uh -huh. a lot of it is based on doing good around the world. That yeah, I think that that's something we share with Christians everywhere. Yeah, that we have a real commitment to doing good in our, where we are and throughout the world. Yes. So um, how does that, do you think that that impacts your, your writing? That's an interesting question. Let's I not think... answer it right now. Let's go back now. Okay. I, I got ahead okay. of ourselves. You okay. are now at Brandeis. You didn't get your PhD. Uh -huh. You had a baby and then what happened? Um, and then we started moving places and I had more babies. Uh, yeah. And so, um, so I, like all parents, started reading a lot, a lot of picture books and spent a long, t many, many hours of my life reading them and discovered that I really loved picture books. And I do still read books for grownups, but I have to say like a large share for most of my adulthood of my reading time is in children's books, um, picture books and novels. Yeah. And I came to real, and so I was always writing, but I came to realize that like what I really love reading is kid lit. I love the hopefulness, which sometimes I don't find in some adult books. I really love that core of belief in, in hopefulness and, and beauty. And I really value that in kid lit. And so I realized I love that. So that's what I should be writing. I think this is incredible. I was going like this because, you know, nobody should know the secret that we share <laughs> and you have just outed us. Because what, people, if, what if I outed? Well, the people that that who who, who write picture books mm -hmm. generally read picture books and love picture books and don't like to admit that that's their favorite genre of, of literature. Oh, I I admit it. <laughs> yeah, you're the first yeah. on the show to admit it. Oh, really? So, I, so to come yeah. clean and that uh, me too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um. So and but. In, in your church, is there is there some kind of? Um, I know that in the states, there's now um, a, a dispute. Some books are, are considered uh, taboo, including mm -hmm. uh, some books uh, that we grew up on. Um, it, does the church mm -hmm. interfere uh, with with uh, picture books? I don't think so. Good. So when you were a kid, when you were a five year old, <laughs> what picture books did you love? You know, that is such a good question. I remember that we had a Thumbelina book that I really loved. And I have really, um, I, I have kind of vague memories of some of the books. When our family made one of our moves, we moved across the United States. And it was a very, very long way. And it was an expensive move. And so we made the very wrenching decision that we had to get rid of most of our books and my parents said you know we'll just use the library when we get there and so we gave away many boxes of books and we got to our new place and there was not a public library there and it was actually a really traumatic thing for our our family um but i think because of that i don't have as many memories of picture books as I do of novels, but I do have one picture book that I kept. Um, we were each allowed to choose like our favorite books to keep. And I had a book and it was actually about the same size as this book. And it was a little golden book, but it was a very big little golden book that somebody had given me called Little Lost Kitten. And I still have that book. And it was always one of my very favorite book. So, and I, I do still own that book. I did not bring it with me on this most recent move, but it's in the safe place at my home. So that's incredible. So when you started reading uh, picture books to your six children, mm -hmm. uh, what, what became your favorite ones? Um, one that I loved and I would read to them as often as they would let me. <laughs> and then I would read it sometimes just to myself is Snowflake Bentley which just, it amazed me. I loved that book. I also really liked The Man Who Walked Between Two Towers. Um, and I thought, and um, The Oxcart Man. 
And one of the distinctive things about those books is I didn't think of them as being in any particular category or genre other than picture book until I started really learning about kid lit. And then I realized, oh, like that is a category. Like I, I was really resonating with um, nonfiction, but I never would have told you. In fact, I probably would have told you oh, I don't really like nonfiction. Um, but um, yeah, so I really liked those nonfiction picture books. Ox Cartman is a little nonfiction-y. Maybe it's not technically nonfiction, but has like nonfiction content in it. So mm -hmm. yeah. And you became a primarily nonfiction author. Yeah, and that actually was a little bit of an accident. Um, we had um, we had been living abroad, and I had been writing. My kids were getting older. And I could see the light in the distance that I was going to have extended periods of time that I could write instead of the little tiny um, bits of time. And so we moved to Florida and I knew that I wanted to have a critique group um, because writing, while writing is something you do in isolation, revising is something that is very hard to do in isolation. You need people's responses and you need to be able to talk to people about your writing. So I knew I wanted a critique group um, and I was desperate to find one. So I signed up to go to my first SCBWI conference in Orlando, Florida. And my whole goal at the conference was to find a critique group. And we lived in the city of Jacksonville. And at the conference, we each got a name tag that you wore so you could get into the various events. And it had your name pretty big. And then underneath it in little print, it had your city. And so I spent the entire conference walking around trying to read the names of the cities under people. And I could not find anybody else there from Jacksonville until the last day of the conference. I went into a session and I was carefully reading everybody's names and I saw two women who had Jacksonville written on there. And so I didn't even, I can't even tell you what the session was about because I was plotting the whole time how I was gonna get over and get to them before they left. And so I went and I told them, I've just moved to Jacksonville. I want a critique group, do you have one? And they told me that they, their critique group had just dissolved, that they were thinking of starting a new one, but that they wrote nonfiction and was that okay? And I said, yeah, that's great. Um, and so I started in this critique group and they're still my very dear writer friends. Um, and so what, what, started, what year was this, Annette? Uh, 2014 uh, or 2015. My husband's correcting me. I think maybe 20. Oh uh, yeah. Maybe it was earlier than that. So. Where, where's your, where's your husband? He's, he's, we're in a studio apartment. <laughs> he's over there. But anyway, I say, can't say hello to, say hello to the professor. Hello. So yeah. So it, maybe it was earlier than that, 2012 or something like that. Um, but uh, I started reading non nonfiction, children's nonfiction, and that's when I realized that I really did already love um, nonfiction, and I started trying to write it. And so it was a. I found that it was a very happy home for me. In many ways, a much better home for me than any other kind of writing that I had done. But getting into it was a little bit of an accident. So a very happy accident. Wow. So um, before we talk about finding an agent and finding publishers mm -hmm. for your books, um, mm -hmm. do, you, do you believe that these accidents uh, are like ordained from, from God or some benevolent yeah. spirit? I, yeah, I believe that they can be. Um, and I do believe that um, I do believe in the general goodness of people and that and that life, um, one of the great blessings of life is to have these people in your life. And so um, Jennifer Swanson is one of the people who was in that critique group who's since gone on to be very widely pub published. And Sophia Golds is another one who's also been very widely published. And I do feel like their influence on my life goes, uh, it's been great on my writing, but also, but probably that's not the most important influence they've had on my life. You know, the the friendships that you gain have all sorts of other, um, bring all sorts of other blessings to your life, but definitely they did bless my writing too. Yeah. Let, let, let's get back to that because that's really interesting. Most of the people I interview, because becoming a traditionally published author it's so rare. It's so very rare. It's 
one mm -hmm. in a thousand, one in 5,000 mm -hmm. mm -hmm. authors. Um, and almost everybody has a story. You know, so if I were religious, I'd say, oh, that's, you know, that's your ordained ship or yeah. whatever it is. Um, so it, it's very interesting that most of the people on the show have tremendous skills, but mm -hmm. it's really not enough. You know, you have to have some mm -hmm. spectacular mm -hmm. thing happen to you or several spectacular mm -hmm. things. So mm -hmm. great. So now you have your critique group and you go back to Jacksonville and right. what happened? Um, yeah, so I worked on manuscripts. Um, uh, Jen Swanson, Jennifer Swanson is how she publishes, but um, Jen was kind of like our leader and she was already um, published a lot in the educational press. And um, she really pushed me to do things like attend conferences, which were very transformative for me um, and really helpful. And, and we would meet every... I think we met every week or at least every other week at, in a library conference room and we would exchange uh, manuscripts and we all kind of worked together and we all became traditionally published like, you know, not at the same moment, but like it really was that, that I, I love that, um, that saying that a rising tide lifts all boats. And I think that was very true. I think the fact that we were working together, that we were helping each other improve and, um, and sharing our knowledge and sharing our insights. And that's um, that's been my experience with critique groups that- And my they, experience interviewing authors. That makes sense. Very, very often, several members of one critique group will go on mm -hmm. to spectacular success mm -hmm. separately and together. Yeah. And then what happened? Um, yeah, and so then Jen had told us that she was going to go to a non a, a special SCBWI nonfiction conference, and that we all should. And I dithered, and um, finally I said, "Okay, I'll go." And so the it was um, Falling Leaves Conference, which is done in uh, upstate New York, and they do special focuses. So they had done a nonfiction focus. It was the first time they'd done it. And uh, it was a pretty amazing group that was there. If you know children's nonfiction, um, Melissa Stewart was there. There were all sorts oh. of people who are really big names who were attending as attendees. Um, and there were was a great set of editors and we each had a 20 minute session with an editor. So we had submitted um, manuscripts for that editor. And so mine was with Alyssa Mito Pusey who's from Charles Bridge. And I sat down with her and it became clear right away that she did not like the manuscript that I had submitted. And so I was desperately trying to salvage the, the time I had with her to be meaningful. And so I started like pitching her ideas that I had kind of had on my idea list. And one of them, she said, oh, I am interested in that. If you decide to write that, then send it to me. And so I decided, well, I guess that's the one I'm going to write. And so I wrote, um, it was about a Chinese American trail chef who helped lobby for the National Park Service. And so I did the research and I wrote the manuscript and sent it. To, my critique group worked on it with me a really long time until I felt really good about it. And I sent it to her. And then there was just silence for a year. And I was visiting my brother and I got an email from Alyssa and she said that she had taken it to acquisition committee and that they had said no, but these were their responses. And if I wanted to revise it, I could resubmit it. And I was so excited. And I ran and told my brother, I have great news. And I told him what had happened. And he said, that's great news. <laughs> and I realized you are not in the kidlet world. Yes, that is great news. <laughs> and so I, I revised it and I resubmitted it. Um, and Alyssa was a wonderful shepherd of that manuscript. She managed to get it through the acquisition committee. And so that was my first manuscript um, that was purchased and published. Okay. So it was purchased directly by Charles by Bridge? By Charles Bridge, yes. And did you have an agent? Did you find an agent then? I did not. Um, and I actually had not started looking for an agent until after that. And then I started to get really frustrated with the very few number of um, places that I could submit. And I thought, I think maybe I do want an agent. And so then I started the agent hunt a little bit later. And the industry has actually changed in those intervening years. It was, at that time, there were nonfiction authors who did not have agents and just 
um, pitched their manuscripts to trade publishers. I think that that is almost, I can't think of any traditionally published um, nonfiction authors now who don't have agents. I think that's been a real shift in the industry. So yeah, so I think you need an agent now. Okay, so how did you find your agent? You have a very famous agent. I do. I found her um, when she was not with, uh, I'm with Andrea Brown Liter Literary and Kathleen Rushall is my very, very wonderful agent. Um, but she was a pretty young agent when I first um, signed with her. She was with Marshall Lyon Literary. So she was with a different agency. Um, and I had read something that she had written about wanting manuscripts uh, about um, people with she had described the kind of character she was looking for. And although it wasn't fiction, I did think I was writing a manuscript about the first woman to run the Boston Marathon. And um, the personality that she had seemed to fit what Kathleen was looking for. And so I sent her a note saying, you know, I read that this is what you're looking for. And I do think that this fits. And, um, and I've heard you talk on these interviews about how, how, even if you have a good manuscript, it's not, it's still hard to get an agent. And it just, and I was lucky because when I sent that manuscript to Kathleen, she was looking for a nonfiction author. She had one already, but she was looking to increase the proportion of nonfiction on her list. And um, so she liked the manuscript and, um, and I liked talking to her. And we've just gone on from there. And I really do value her. Um, I value both her her readings uh, when she reads my manuscripts. I kind of hate it when she does because she almost always has things that she thinks I should do differently. And then I think, oh. then I have to go back and revise them. But then I'm really happy because I realize, oh yeah, she was actually right. And it is much better. And I really like, she moved to Andrea Brown and I was lucky enough to get to go with her. And that's been very nice too, because sometimes they will, as a group, a group of agents will read manuscripts and also send comments. And so that's been a really lovely home to be at. It's a wonderful agency. So so um, before we move on, Annette, you've, uh, this is a really uh, wonderful interview because you're touching on things that we haven't, I've interviewed about 60 authors and we, we haven't talked about the angst that follows these, uh, these <laughs> reviews. Yeah. Where um, an editor will say to you, um, I like the story, but I don't like the ending. And yeah. if, if you're Jewish, you have a terrible oy vey moment. I don't know <laughs> what your church has, but, and then you say, oh no, this is such a great ending. And, and she doesn't like my ending and what I'm going to do. And then like a few days later or a few hours later, after this terrible angst, you say, uh -huh. oh. Yeah. Yeah, I just actually had that experience with, it's not to an editor yet, but I I have a manuscript that's getting ready to go out on submission, and I thought it was ready to go on submission, so I send it to Kathleen, and she read it, and she um, she's always very good to tell me what she likes about it, which I appreciate it, there were things she liked about it, but then she told me that like she didn't like the beginning, and she didn't think it would invite children into the story, and it was really discouraging because I'd worked so hard to come up with that shape of it. Um, but I went once to a conference and I don't remember who said this, but someone in a session said that his strategy was to just pretend that the editor or the agent is right and just see what happens. And so that's kind of what I do. Then I think, okay, well, like if she is right, then like, what do I need to do? And I just sent her the revision, which I have to say she was totally right. And I think it is much stronger um, because she gave me that kind of difficult response for me to receive. But then because I was able to pretend like she was right, I realized, oh yeah, she actually was right. Yes, editors are wonderful. I don't know why some true. people trash them and they're yeah. so modest because they don't, they just sometimes, they, and, and a good editor will not say to you, I want you to finish um, the story that the blue duck becomes yellow again. Um, they'll just say, mm, I why? Don't know, something, something doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and leave it to you. <laughs> but they don't, they don't take credit and they don't want credit. They're happy to be behind the scenes mm -hmm. and they're really wonderful. And, and, um, 
and agents uh, are also unfairly uh, singled out um, because of the difficulties of the industry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there are only so many books that will sell in a year. And so, yeah, so really great manuscripts do get passed over. Uh, yeah. But, and okay, so you are one of the many thousands uh, who have a wonderful agent mm -hmm. and uh, several wonderful books out. And, um, and uh, it's so ha I'm so happy to have you on the show. Now, okay. let's, so this is all, I'll been a segue to your new book. Uh, yeah. which we're gonna we're gonna talk about now. I'm gonna beg your pardon and shut the door because there's a little noise in the background. Hold on. Don't say anything important no until problem. I get back. I'll be silent. The dangers of the internet. Okay, I apologize for that. No problem. So, so now we're 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 um this this book before music. Mm -hmm. Um I'm I'm intrigued. Um I, I can understand the idea for the previous books. Uh mm -hmm. by the way, I should say that I've read the um the Boston Marathon Lady Runner. Mm -hmm. It was beautiful. <laughs> Thank um, you. but you know, you you can imagine where you might get this idea. Before music is like out of nowhere. I'm a musician. Yeah. And it's an out of nowhere book. How what happened? How did yeah. you get the idea? So it was actually a, another conference that I went to. I, I really get good things from conferences. I was at um, the National Council of uh, Social. Uh, no, no, I'm going back too far. I can't remember what conference I'd been to, but it was one where we were talking about nonfiction and I was really inspired. And I had um, a plane ride to get home. And so after the conference, I was sitting on the plane and I was thinking like, what do I, what do I know that I want to write about? And um, our children played musical instruments. They had, we had two violinists, a cellist and a bass. And so I practiced with them and I spent many hours practicing and I thought, okay, that's something I know. And so on the plane, even though I don't write poetry, I wrote this rhyming text about uh, the um, things that go make up a violin, the wood in, and the horse hair and all of those things. And I really, really liked it, but it also felt really slight and didn't feel like it was big enough to be a book. And so I didn't know what to do with it. So I played with it a little bit, but then it just kind of was sitting in a folder on my computer. And then a few years later, I went to the National Council on Social Studies. I was um, presenting at it, but I also went to sessions and I loved being at that, um, at that conference. I have friends who are science writers and I really admire their writing, but I've never, it's never been a kind of writing that has really resonated with me to do. I mean, I like reading their writing, but it, I don't feel like I'm a science writer. And so I'd had a hard time defining myself. And at that conference, I realized ah, I am a social studies writer. That's what I am. And so um, on the plane ride home again, this was another plane thing. I was thinking, okay, so like if I'm a social studies writer, then like, what can I write about? And I was trying to think of different categories of so social studies. And I thought of geography and I thought, well, geography is all about how people use what's around them to create culture. And I remembered that violin um, poem that I had written and it and the idea just came to me. I thought that's what I can write about is how people use what's around them to make music. And, um, and I have grandchildren like I know you do and, the, and they're very young. Um, they were even younger when I started working on this book. And I wanted to write a book that was short enough for my very young grandchildren. And so I wrote a really, really short, compact manuscript. I think it was 169 words that was based around this idea. But I also love back matter. And so I put a lot of back matter in it. And it went out on submission. And, um, and I'd already published with, or I was already working on a book with Abrams. And an ed a different editor at Abrams saw that. And th she came back to me and she said, 
hey, what if we made the back matter into the book? Wow. And I told her, well, I really like the really brief text. So like, can we marry them? <clears throat> and so you were talking about how editors don't get enough credit. And this is a really good example because she and I together worked out what the book could be. So we worked out the idea of having a through line that was kind of a picture booky thing. So that, that explains this, uh, this uh, uh, structure. Yeah. With the, the lyric text and then the explaining text. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, and it was something, and Courtney Code is the editor for it. She's a, a brilliant Abrams editor. And um, and it was actually one of the most fun things that I've done in my writing career is to work with her and figure out how we could do it. And um, I was a little worried about it because we do have, there's like a through line where you have <laughs> through it. And so I wasn't sure how it would work, but Courtney kept saying, page design will do, you know, book designers are magical. And she was right. They came up with a really brilliant book design. So it's really clear how to read the book. Um, even if you're not a reader, even if you're a kid just looking through it, the, the way they've designed the pages makes it really clear what you're supposed to do. Um, yeah. And so it was a fun project to work on. She, that she deserves kudos because it, it, it's very clever. I've, I've, I can't remember seeing a book. So now it's, I, can, I can look at it as like text, back matter in the middle of the book. Yeah. <laughs> text. Yeah, we need we need a new term for back matter. Yeah, it's, and that was Courtney's it, idea to it's, do that. It, it's middle matter. Yeah, you, yeah. You've, so you've it, invented it a not, new genre here. Well, I, it's not really a new genre in the nonfiction world. It would be called layered text. Um, it's not usually layered in the way it is in this book. So in that way, it is new. But yeah, but it's not something I would have thought of. And so that's a great thing about that's something I love about picture books is the whole collaborative element. And this time, the editor was a huge piece of the collaborative element in figuring out how we could make this all work without confusing our readers. Um, yeah. And um, the illustrator, who chose the illustrator? Uh, the, Abrams did, yeah. Um, Courtney and the art director worked together to um, find her. And they were especially, she had some Instagram uh, um, posts that were things like herbs and stuff like that. And it just seemed to be the kind of naive art that they thought would work really well with this. And it, I, the art is just gorgeous. I, in fact, um, sometimes people ask me to like show my favorite spread and I hate it when they do that because I keep thinking, this is my favorite. No, no, no. This is my favorite one. No, this one, because the art is really beautiful. The one that you showed was your second favorite spread. Well, I think it's my favorite one, along with about five <laughs> or six other spreads. So, I show really show us that. another one for the people that can see on the video. Okay. Yeah. And uh, the, people, the people on the podcast are just going to have to run out and buy this book. It's an incredible book. Um, <laughs> Thank you. It, it's fun. It's anthropological. Uh, and um, I'm a musician and I teach music and I learned a lot of things reading it. And yeah. it, it brought up a lot of things in my mind. If, if I were writing this book before music, I would mm -hmm. take another tech and it's yeah. so wonderful. I would probably talk about the parts of the body. And oh. um, so that's why I loved it so much. You know, you don't want to, you, know, you don't want to see something that you'd expect to see. Say, oh, wow. Look at this and look at that and look at that. Yeah, yeah. So the picture I'm showing is of a man playing an ocarina mm -hmm. with alpacas around him. And I think Madison is the ultimate drawer of alpacas. I love all of her alpacas. They were so great. But um, but yeah, one of the fun things about this book for me was figuring out this the structure of how to decide how to categorize musical instruments. Um, and I, I really love your idea of using different parts of the body, but originally I thought, well, I'll just do like woodwinds, brass, you know, strings. But then I realized that that's a very Western point of view. And I started researching ways other people have categorized musical instruments. And it was very mind blowing in a really exciting way. And I realized, oh, like there's not just one best way to think about instruments. Um, and so that was a super fun thing. So these instruments are categorized by material that they're made of, which is loosely based on the Chinese method of categorization. But you're absolutely right that there are other ways that you could do it. And I hope kids will um, 
will let their minds be blown by that and think of other ways like you did. Like, um, yeah, because they're uh, the human capacity for organization is kind of amazing. Yes. So, um, and I'm just going to give a shout out to uh, Professor Michael Spitzer, who's been on the, the show. And um, he has a book out uh, called <laughs> The Musical Man, where he makes the contention that we're human beings because of music. Oh, interesting. So we are actually beings that are separated from the primates hmm. because we started to walk and we started to have rhythm and we listened to the birds and then our pharynx fell or larynx or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And then we began, we had greater prosody in our voices. Mm -hmm. um, maybe even there was music before language, maybe language and music were together and then maybe they are the yeah. same thing to this very day. Yeah, so, yeah. I did. I did read an interesting scholarly article arguing that humans probably sang before they talked, which was a really exciting notion to me. Yeah. So um, this is this is a remarkable book. I I can't uh, recommend it uh, strongly enough. Uh, and I'm certainly going to get a um, signed copy the next time I'm in Austria. <laughs> Great. <laughs> or wherever you are, I'll track you down. That's um, right. So um, we're, we're close to the end of the show. Um, what do you have now on the uh, on the burners? Uh, the thing that is scheduled and announced so far is the sequel to Before Music. It is called Before Colors, and it is also a large format book, just like this. And it is also illustrated by Madison, and it is off at the printers, um, and. And I'm very excited about it. It's about how, where pigments and dyes come from. So that's wow. what's coming up. And it's coming out next June, June 2023. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah. I'm excited for it. Yes. Um, you and I are going to have to have another conversation off, uh, off stage. Okay. We're not going to share it with everybody else. Okay. Um, so a, a, towards the end of the end, what <laughs> advice do you have for the 99.9% .9 of authors uh, who are uh, submitting, writing, revising? What is the secret sauce? Uh, well, I think this is not consoling, but I think part of it is you have no control over um, it depends on your being in the right place at the right time. But there are things you do have control over. And one is that you keep writing, that, um, that you produce work. And the other is that you do a lot. I think writing is really important, but I also think reading is very, very important. Um, I think that's the way you, you know what the publishing industry is that's the way you know what you like and what you don't like um and and I think you also internalize many writing lessons from reading and I also think it's how I have best been able to identify ideas that are good ideas is because like if I know what's out there then if I think of an idea then I can begin to know whether it's already been done or if there's a gap that it might fit in. So I would say that my best advice is to not worry about what you don't have control over and to just lean into what you do have control over. I also heard somebody else that you had interviewed talk about how researching um, agents and things takes a lot of time. And one of the things that made a huge difference to me is I am um, I really, I am a checklist person. And so I would have my to-do list and I always wanted to have writing time every day. And it made a big difference when I decided that my writing time could be spent researching agents and editors and that that counted as writing time. Um, so, you know, that's something you can do is you can research it, even though you can't control how they'll respond to your um, writing. But yeah, so worry about what you can control and just let go of what you can't is my best advice. That's great advice. That's wonderful advice. Is there anything that I haven't remembered to ask you, Annette? I, I think you did an amazing job coming up with things. I appreciate so much how you highlight new books and 
I highlight ah, the creators. So you you wanted to ask. So you wanted to ask why I do this. Yeah, I and I I do I, I do this do because I love interviewing incredible authors like you, um, people who write picture books um, have some, I think, according to my theory, some of their personalities stuck when they were five years old. Uh, maybe I think I'm case, a seven year old. Seven. Yeah. Okay. Seven is good. But your, your picture book, by the way, is, is not necessarily for five year olds because there's a lot of text, lots yeah. to learn. You can start when you're five. But, you know, when you're nine or 10, there's still a lot of meat in that uh, in that book. That's true. That's true. Um, and um, and I think that I've met over the Internet some of the nicest people just by doing this show. Mm. And um, I really am in awe of the authors I, I interview and I learn a lot. You know, so imagine, you know, like um, I don't talk about it on the show, but. I write and I have books on submission. And um, every time I interview somebody, I get ideas and I get points of view. And I say, mm -hmm. oh, I should pay more attention, you know, to this or that. Mm -hmm. And then you'll mm -hmm. say something, the other one say something. Uh, and uh, we're all on a journey together. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm I'm tickled pink to interview people like you. That's the truth. Yeah, well, thank you for putting interviews out in the world. I, we appreciate it. Yeah, but, you know, I benefit at, at, as much or more than the writers and um, the audience. And as you may see, I get a huge kick out of it, and I, I love it. So I can't wait to actually meet you and other writers that I've interviewed. Uh, and um, we're going to, before I become all gooey and start crying <laughs> i'll uh, just thank you annette annette bay pimentel thank you so much mel i appreciate and, it and uh, we've been celebrating your wonderful book out with abrams just a few months ago before music and uh please uh, be sure to contact me when before colors okay. comes out um and um it's a plan i can't I can't wait for our next time. And I uh, do want to hop on a uh, a call with you in a week or two. Okay. Thanks so much. To, to, talk, to talk about the stuff that we couldn't talk about. <laughs> okay. This has been great. So I'm Mel Rosenberg, the host of the Children's Literature Channel for NBN, having the time of my life. Annette, thank you very much for being on the show. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye. Uh, here we go. Bye-bye, really. <laughs>